Thank you both so much for, for um, being with us to, to process what we've just uh, seen. Uh, there's a lot to process. Um, I was hoping you could, we could jump right in uh, and speak a bit about the background of the film. You uh, have worked together, you've collaborated together on other film projects. Uh, but this film is a bit of a departure, I think. It's, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, the sort of true crime um, aspect of it is uh, drawn from a nonfiction text. Uh, and I wonder if you could just speak a bit about the, the source text and how you came to it and how you decided to approach it in order to tell a very particular political narrative. Um, yes, uh, well, thank you for having us here. And uh, the, the starting point of the film uh, was uh, a book written by an author called uh, Pauline Guénard. And Pauline Guénard spent uh, one year in 2016 uh, with the crime squad in Versailles near Paris. Uh, really for a whole year, day in, day out, she uh, stayed with the uh, investigators. And so the, the book is, is not a novel, it's a non-fiction text where she describes the uh, everyday police work uh, within that that crime unit, and so she there are several investigations, and uh, she's talking about. And the the last investigation she describes is the one that you've seen in the the film. So it's about 50 pages out of uh, 500. And when I read the book, what I liked about that particular investigation was the way she described how one of the investigators uh, gets obsessed with uh, that case that haunts him, and, uh, and especially because it's uh, an unsolved uh, crime, and he is not able to, to solve it. And so that was one of the things we were interested in to describe how an unsolved case affects the, the investigators, uh, how they handled that, or what kind of uh, frustration or anger or deception it, it uh, generates. And we felt that it was an interesting uh, approach to a, a crime story because usually the, the rule of the game of a crime story is you have the crime in the beginning and then the criminal at the, at the end. And here it's not the case, so it was some kind of a challenge because we still wanted the, the audience to be interested and involved, of course. Um, and, uh, and we wanted to describe the, the evolution of this main character uh, of, of Johan. And then when we started very soon, when we started working on it with uh, Gilles on the screenplay, we felt that because it was the murder of a young woman, uh, a femicide, that uh, the, the violence of men towards women uh, would be uh, an important part of the, of the project, or as uh, Johan puts it, there's something amiss between uh, men and, and, and women. So we wanted to explore uh, that angle uh, as well. I wonder if you could speak a bit about your approach to crafting the story, to writing the screenplay, um, especially on a structural level, um, both the fact that, as you mentioned, you, you open the film with an announcement that the case was never closed. And so, in a sense, you're preparing the audience to be um, left hanging at the end uh, and, and to just resist that um, sort of narrative need to have an answer at the end of the film. And at the same time, the, the, the story itself is very textured by the, the lived experience of being a, a cop on this investigative force and the frustrations around budget and overtime pay and a wonky printer that doesn't work. And um, so in a sense, it's, a, it's an incredibly suspenseful film, and yet a film that's very rooted in the everyday. And how did you go about building suspense within that framework? Um, well, I mean, you're right in saying that the, the description, I mean, we really wanted the, the film also to be a quite uh, 
honest uh, description of what police work is really like, uh, even with the parts that are, seem not so uh, sexy uh, in a way. And, uh, and because it's, and, and, and that was really very present in, in the book. I mean, the, the whole uh, time it takes to write reports and uh, to have the pressure to, to write them correctly because every mistake can, uh, can, can uh, be a problem later uh, when the criminal is being judged if he gets caught. And uh, so we, we wanted to, to show that and, and it's true that the book was of course already very much uh, documented and full of interesting details and we also I, I mean, earlier I said that we focused on the last 50 pages, but there were a lot of details uh, earlier on that we also uh, used. And I, I, at one point I also felt the need to witness directly uh, what it was uh, like to be in, in a crime squad like that. So I spent only one week, but that was uh, very helpful with the uh, police in Grenoble, where the film was uh, shot, and being able to observe those men, because they are still exclusively uh, men in those uh, crime squads, uh, to observe them, how the, the group dynamic worked, uh, how uh, it, 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 yeah, how all this violence and uh, this crime uh, affects uh, them, and um, and we felt that by saying from the start, okay, this is going to be an unresolved case, it was a way to be. Uh, honest with the audience and also to tell them, uh, look, this, I mean, you, we're not going to give you the killer at the end, but that allows you to look elsewhere and to observe uh, other things. And uh, of course it was a risk in a way, and, uh, but the thing is that uh, Gilles had uh, just before directed uh, a series for uh, Netflix, a documentary series on a uh, the most famous uh, French crime, which is called the Gregory case, and which is also an unresolved case. And, uh, and he did it very brilliantly, and it, it was quite successful, and we felt that the people, the, the audience, despite the fact that that was also an unresolved case, uh, were still drawn into it and wanted to know more about it. And so uh, we felt that that was really the, the right path. And I, I think that by knowing that the case is going to be unresolved, we, I, we even identify more with the investigators because with each suspect we are still you know, very attentive to know maybe there is a detail that will tell us that after all, it could be more this one or more that one. And uh, so we wanted, I mean, this choice of the, the unresolved crime was not because we said, okay, we're gonna frustrate the, the, the audience. On the contrary, we still wanted it to be full of uh, tension and suspense and to, to draw the audience uh, into the, the, the story. I'm, uh, you know, watching the film, uh I'm struck by um, sort of the, the resonances with other great examples of, of police procedurals that similarly uh, sort of live in ambiguity and don't uh, require a resolution in order to say something. Um, could you speak just a bit about how you see this film fitting in a tradition of other crime narratives? Um. Yes, well, there, I mean, of, of course, there are, uh, I mean, we didn't have other films as direct references, but there are, there were influences, and there are films like uh, Zodiac by David Fincher, who's also talking about unresolved uh, investigation, and, uh, and we think it's, it's uh, fascinating, and uh, then there, there were other influences as well. For instance, we talked about, uh, uh, the Twin Peaks series by David Lynch, and especially the fact how he succeeds in making the, the victim, uh, Laura Palmer, very present throughout the whole series, 
even if you only see her as a corpse at the, at the beginning. And we felt that this was also something we wanted to, to achieve, that the, the Clara character should be present throughout the, the, the whole film and not forget her once the crime is committed and then the main focus is only on the uh, investigators. Uh, so, um, yes, and then I think it also fits into a whole uh, tradition of, of uh, French crime films. I mean, we also talked about uh, <coughs> Jean-Pierre Melville, uh, whose films we we like uh, a lot and there, there are some, I mean, for instance, there, I think one of the challenges was also because uh, crime stories have been so uh, told so many times in TV shows, etc. and sometimes we felt when we wrote dialogue that uh, this, this sounds like a TV show and like a cliche. And so sometimes, for instance, at the beginning on the crime scene when the cops uh, are there all dressed in, in white, we then decided to have no di dialogue at all. Uh, which came also from uh, Melville uh, influence because he often has scenes where it's just looks and gestures and it makes the scenes even stronger and so we, yeah, so we worked into that direction as well. I, uh, you've alluded to the sort of gender politics of the film and, and I think uh, the film itself is, um, it, it it doesn't attempt to be explicit in spelling out a political message, but the narrative of violent misogyny and its ripple effects that it tells is, uh, is quite political. And I think to the end of the film, when we see at last a, a woman cop and a woman judge sort of taking up this case, uh, that clarifies a little bit of a... Of a um, sort of broader context. Could you just speak a bit about um, how you approached this kind of subtle integration of a political message or commentary within um, uh, the, the, a narrative which foregrounds the procedural, the, the mystery, but is also clearly bigger than that? Um, well, from the beginning, we we felt that there there shouldn't be a political message because that's always dangerous when you have uh, answers and uh, and we wanted to ask uh, questions to question certain certain things and like the character of Johan uh, does uh, because he uh, he throughout the film starts questioning certain things. I mean, he, the, 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 the fact that they, that it's only men working on, on, on crimes committed by other men and, and questioning his own masculinity and questioning uh, um, also some prejudices, like the fact that when a woman victim, and when you hear that she had multiple sexual partners, that quickly the idea kind of seeps in where you say, okay, maybe she's a bit responsible for what happened to, to her. And um, so, yes, but it was important for us that those should be questions. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, we, we tried to, to do that. Uh, that you oui, ex excusez-moi, parce que moi, mon anglais est trop mauvais pour que, pour que je parle, donc tu... I will translate. Le, le, enfin Dominique et moi, quand on a écrit le scénario, on, on était nous-mêmes dans des questionnements par rapport à la violence d'un film où on raconte le, le meurtre d'une femme et en pensant aussi à tous les films noirs qui racontent des meurtres de, de femmes. Et donc on, on se retrouvait en fait euh, presque dans la position aussi de ces deux enquêteurs à, à être, euh, comment dire, inquiétés par ces questions-là, par la, 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 la violence des hommes en, envers les femmes. Donc il, le film est aussi une introspection de... de, de de nous-mêmes et on espère des, des, 
des gens qui voient le film sur le, les, les, les questions. C'est n'est pas seulement une, une, une histoire extérieure à nous, c'est des interrogations qui nous, qui nous traversent. Um, yeah, what Gilles is saying is that it was not just a story where we were exterior and just watched something or, or tried to tell something that had nothing to do with us. We were a little bit in the same position as the uh, investigators and, and asking ourselves questions about, you know, what, where, where does this uh, violence uh, come from? And, uh, And it's, it's true that probably five years ago, ten years ago, we wouldn't have made the, the same film. So it's also a question of, of being uh, attentive to what the, the, the whole Me Too movement led to and the importance of, of, of uh, yes, of, of paying attention to that and of, uh, of, uh, of listening to... to, 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 to uh, what women have to, to say uh, and to try to translate those uh, questions into a narrative and into the, uh, a film. I'm going to open it up in just a moment to the audience, but um, I want to touch briefly on the uh, formal and aesthetic qualities of the film. Um, the sort of look of the film is quite stark, both in terms of color and light, but also compositionally, the use of the Grenoble landscape uh, is, is very much foregrounded in the experience of the film, as well as the music. Uh, the, the score is also very stark and very um, sort of bracing, I guess would be a word for it. I just was curious about um, how you conceived of The, these aesthetic choices in relation to the story? Well, I, th I, I think that all the choices you make when making a, a film, uh, be it the choice of the settings or the, or the actors or the music or the sound or the light, uh, all have to be made in order to, to serve the, the narrative and to make it uh, stronger and more effective. And for instance, the, the choice of uh, setting the action in, uh, in the French Alps in, in Grenoble, where the police headquarters are, or in saint jean de maurienne which is a small town nearby. Uh, instinctively, I, I felt that it was right uh, because of the presence of the, the mountains and uh, because the the mountains who surround those uh, towns are, I mean, mountains are of course very beautiful, but when you're in the valley, they are also uh, threatening and they stop you from seeing further, from seeing the horizon and then the, the, the investigators are a little bit in that position as, as well. And, uh, and so we, we felt that uh, that um, uh, contributed to the to the to the story, and it's the same with all the all the choices with the music. Uh, we when I spoke to the the composer who actually did most of the composing before we started the sh shooting, just reading the screenplay, which I think is uh, important and interesting because in a way he's much uh, freer to imagine things, and he immediately had that idea of using uh, voices, uh, which I felt was uh, uh, a very good idea because it, it has to do with uh, what they talk about ghosts, about the, the deaf who live uh, with us, as they say at the end, and also with uh, um, uh, Johan doing his cycling uh, in circles and then we hear his breath and so all, all those things echo with the, with the music. Uh, I'll open it up now. We have a microphone that will be coming around. If you, I'll, I'll call on you if you raise your hand. Um, I see a hand right there. Here's the mic. Okay. Uh, first, merci beaucoup pour le film. Uh, one question, a very short question in the end. Uh, Mike, that you mentioned Zodiac, by Fincher, because this is a movie I was thinking about while watching the movie. I was also thinking about another movie, uh, Memories of Murder, by uh, Bong Joon-ho, uh, both of which are crimes that are not solved. And, and about policemen, they're completely consumed by uh, 
devoured then, to use the words of the film, by, by the cases. One thing that I found interesting about this movie, that unlike those two, the policeman, one of them at least, Yuan, uh, towards the end, he's able to somewhat break that obsession. So he leaves the velodrome and goes to the outside. He always is, uh, has a lot of hope about the, about the, about the new police wound that working with him. And I wanted to talk a little bit about it, the decision to give him sort of a happy end, at least. And the other question, quite quick, I noticed that the song, I, I might be mistaken, but it was composed by you, right? The, the song in English that he sings. Is that something that you composed in the past and used it, or is something that you did now to sound like a movie, for, uh, like a song from the 80s? Thank you. Um, well, just to first answer your second question, uh, I, I did in, indeed write the lyrics of the uh, song Angel in the Night. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, I wrote it for the, for the film and then the, the uh, composer did the, the, the music. Um, and uh, f in regard to your uh, first question, which uh, is uh, a, a good question because we, we felt that it was important that because the film is quite dark, there should be uh, some light uh, at, at the end. And we didn't, it's not because it's an unresolved case that we wanted it to be uh, bitter or despairing. And this is why the evolution of Johan's character was uh, important and that we feel that even if after the three year uh, uh, that have passed, he feels like he's given up and that he thinks, okay, they, that they blew it. Uh, that the, his discussions with the judge who asks him to you know, take up again the investigation or then also the discussions he has with, um, with a young policewoman who joins the group uh, later on, that, it, that gives him some kind of new energy and that he finds the, the strength to, to pick up the investigation again and not to give up. And I, I think that this is something that is uh, quite important to, to both of us, this idea that, I mean, even today in the world that seems pretty fucked up, that it's easy to just say, okay, uh, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. And he, uh, he, realizes the, the, the importance of, you know, of continue to, to try and not to give up, even if there's no guarantee of a positive result. But it's as if he understood that he owes it to the victim that he has to, you know, continue to work on the, on the case. And... Um, on dit éloge de la persévérance. Éloge de la persévérance. <laughs> uh, comment on peut traduire ça? Uh, Someone has an idea for translating <laughs> éloge de la persévérance. Elegy for perseverance? Sorry. Sorry. An elegy? Uh, mm, no, it's not elegy. Sorry? Praising the perseverance, exactly. So, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think there was a... Yeah. Yes. Here's a mic. Thank you. Hi. Um, I also have a question about Johan. So um, I just noticed that throughout the film, we learn about the background of some of the investigators. Like we saw that Marceau had clearly a connection with his wife, and that's why she he came after Napoli, um, and why he was asking about sex friends and whether that was normal. Even with the young woman, um, young investigator who came in. Later, we learned that her parents died. Um, with Johan, we almost have no background on him. Was that a deliberate choice? And if what it was, then why? Uh, yes, it was a deliberate choice. But uh, what's interesting is in the screenplay, we put in some background information, which was then in the first uh, uh, rough cut. And we felt that we didn't need it. And that actually, the less we knew about him, the, the better it was. And uh, what we know is that he, well, he, he tries to control his uh, emotions and that he, by strictly following the police procedure, by doing his cycling in order to, you know, 
get off the, 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 the pressure and uh, by having no family life and by being entirely committed to his work. And we feel that like uh, his, uh, uh, like Marceau, he actually, it's almost as if he was afraid that his emotions could also uh, overwhelm him and that he tries to block that off. And that's what we thought was really interesting and we had some kind of psychological explanation for that but it felt very artificial and un unnecessary and I won't tell you what it was. And, uh, <laughs> so we cut it out. <laughs> I think uh, I see a hand in the very back. We have time for just one more. Uh, there's a mic coming up to you. Thank you so much for coming and present. Oh, can you hear? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for coming and presenting the film. Um, I was really interested in the first um, suspect, the rapper, who has the really incriminating song, and the last su suspect, uh, Mats, I think, who uh, they were sort of the only characters of color, and I thought Mats maybe was doing sort of a prayer at the end. Um, I was wondering how much of that was done with like. Uh, based on the case, and how much of it was your imagination or observation? Um, okay, thank you for your question. There, there, well, um, actually, in the, in the description of the case in the, in the book, there, there, there was a description of several suspects. We didn't put all of them in, but uh, some of them. And uh, we felt that the, the, the rapper who sings this, this song was one of the more interesting uh, suspects because it's also about, I mean, this whole, there, there's also a whole thing about the, the importance of, of words. We have the, the character of Marceau, who is uh, a frustrated French teacher. He wanted to be a French teacher, but had to, uh, for some reasons, work in the, in the police. So there's this thing of the importance of language and the use of words and what words you use and uh, and for for this guy and some of the other suspects you feel that the that the words uh, have lost their importance and that they don't realize how violent uh, even a, you know a song or a word uh, can be uh, and that they think it has no consequences to say uh, or express violent things by by words and um, so, uh, so the, this uh, suspect, who, who the, the rapper, was one of the suspects in the in the book and in the the real case. Uh, what we changed was that we had Marceau force him to sing the song during the interrogation, which was not uh, had not happened in the in the real interrogation. And uh, as far as the the guy on the in the graveyard is concerned. That uh, was one of the things that I found quite extra extraordinary in the real case because that really happened. I mean, when they picked up the investigation three years later and they did put a camera in the graveyard and there was really this weird guy mm -hmm. who came and did weird things on the, on the grave, but then uh, they, they, I mean, he had a perfect alibi and it couldn't be him, but that's something you wouldn't, almost not there to invent as a screenwriter, and so I, I felt that there was ver something very very fictional uh, about it, so we wanted, of course, to, to keep that and to put that in. I, we could certainly keep the conversation going, but unfortunately, we're out of time, so thank you all so much, and thank you both very much. Thank you, thank you.